Okay. Are, we, are we doing video? Is this a video podcast? This video, yeah. Sadly, yes. No. This face for <laughs> right. radio, well, so unfortunately, I, gets used in video I, now. Yeah. I uh, there there is that light coming. You know what? Let me um, let me close that light so you don't have that like glare right here. Sure. I'll be also, right. Noah, I'll go be right. go hide the sex bot. It's really embarrassing to have the sex bot in the background. You have to get rid of that. You know me. I'm not the sex bot type. <laughs> you know we we can bring that up and talk about it if you're comfortable with that. Now. Yeah, yeah, I'll talk about anything. <laughs> the agenda seems uh, remarkably bereft of rabbits. I have to say, given that we're discussing Noah Smith discourse. We'll talk about rabbits. This is uh, wait. We'll talk can, about can, can we start Tony, off the episode by giving Noah credit that this this person produces the the amount of content that you produce on like a, like a daily like weekly basis is insane antonio really? lived well, this life for a little bit well but i was nowhere near as good as noah smith right like no i mean you are obviously a very successful on Substack. if you actually look at your subcraft like you can didn't you actually being a kind of matrician didn't you actually fit it to a line and you had yeah. like an r squared of like 0.9 or something so like that's incredible or nine wow so it's just that's that's amazing up and Does up line go up and it's like consistency kids no. it, it yeah. works i don't need exponential growth i'm happy with linear growth world <laughs> it's so, cool yeah uh, it's I'm, yeah. I'm trying to catch matt iglesias right so this is part of what convinced me to get to leave the Substack world because like the prize for beating matt iglesias is that now you're matt iglesias and like <laughs> I, do you do, do you really do you really want that prize no <laughs> ah but i have hair that's the difference <laughs> <laughs> okay. My tagline would be Matt Iglesias with hair. <laughs> SecureFrame is the leading all-in-one platform for security and privacy compliance. SecureFrame helps you get SOC 2 audit ready in weeks, not months, and it's used by thousands of companies like AngelList, Coda, and Remote. I believe in the company so much I invested in it and I recommend it to all my portfolio companies. Sign up for a free demo at secureframe.com and mention Moment of Zen during your demo to get 20% off your first year of SecureFrame. Noah, welcome to, to Moment of Zen. Thanks for joining. Thank you. So, so Noah, we were just talking about how Olson's model is that institutions really matter. Uh, we were talking earlier that Zehan's model is that geography, demographics, and energy really matters. Our mutual friend Bology thinks that uh, technology and IQ uh, really matters in, in terms of determining country success. W where do you net out in terms of your kind of worldview of, of, of what really matters? Well, it's, it's pretty contingent. I think, um, you know, technology is, is pretty important. So if you look at the United States in the 20th century, we were very, very good at industrial tech. We were great at railroads. We were great at you know, anything with an internal combustion engine in it. We are great at aerospace stuff, which is a lot harder than people realize. Um, great at cars. That won us World War II. Um, and, you know, then later we were great at computer science, uh, you know, building internet, computers, precision guided weapons, whatever that we used in Desert Storm. I don't know. Um, but these mastery of these key technologies was always very important for the United States. And uh, I don't know if that's sort of a general thing um, you know, you can read Kennedy, like Paul Kennedy, Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, if, you know, he sort of claims something along these lines, you know, that uh, that mastery of these key technologies is really is sort of the key to which country is powerful. I, I kind of buy that. You know, I, I, I think, um, you know, what are the key technologies now? You look at things like AI, you look at things like next generation networking um, and things like that, and, and maybe some other stuff, too. Uh, but but those are going to be really important to what country is powerful. I do think, I mean, geography obviously matters, you know, not being near to Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union or Imperial Japan really helped us out in World War II, right? Um, you, when you're a powerful country and you have neighbors who don't like you, you know, and you're throwing your weight around, the neighbors are often not going to like it. And that's why Russia's neighbors don't like Russia and China's neighbors don't like China. And, you know, if our neighbors were more powerful, they might not like us either. You know, like imagine if Canada had like 200 million people, uh, you know, they might, we might get in spats all day, but they don't, um, you know, imagine if, if like Mexico is really rich, we might get in, in spats more often, but they're not. Um, and so that's sort of, you know, that's, that's a situation here. So in that sense, geographic isolation can help us, but geographic isolation hurts us because we don't get to take advantage of the agglomeration effects. So, China, in addition to being really big, is also right next to Japan and Korea and Malaysia and all these countries, Taiwan and, and Singapore. And they can really take advantage of this local 
electronics chain. You know, for a long time, China's main electronics imports came from assembling the components made in Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan into final goods and then reshipping them basically to the United States. And then they sort of climbed up the value chain from there. But it was very helpful to be close to these other countries geographically so that they could take advantage of this clustering. Um, and so that is, that's really important. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. There's advantages and disadvantages to being geographically isolated. And I think that when you look at manufacturing jobs leaving the United States, you're looking at the downside of geographic isolation because we're just not in the world's electronic supercluster, right? We're, and we're not really in the world's automotive supercluster either, uh, which is like Europe and also East Asia are the two sort of automotive superclusters, and we're not there either. We're just sort of on our own doing our own thing, like a giant Ireland sitting off here, like in space, just by herself. And so that's a disadvantage. So I think that, that Zehan doesn't uh, maybe uh, hit on agglomeration economies enough. Yeah. He, he's super bearish on on China. He thinks it's going to implode in the next decade. Um, and also um, R- Russia as well. Um, you, you, you've written quite, quite a bit about, about those two countries and, and what they mean and you know, how, how inter- U.S. should intersect with them. What, why don't you unpack your thoughts there? Uh, about China and Russia? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so so I don't know. I, I feel like the whole, like, China's going to collapse, stuff like that. It's a little sensationalized. Like, I don't think that they will collapse. They might. You, countries do collapse, but it's not common. And it's usually only after a really big war. Like, you sometimes, like you'll see a civil war. That's the only way you collapse without, like, a major international war. Yeah, you could have a big Chinese civil war, but I would bet against it just because it's a middle income country. Now it's got this pretty good infrastructure. It's got like lots of sort of local provincial people who have their networks of power. You could have a collapse, but I think it would take a lot longer than that. I think when you see China collapse in the old days, it would be like, you know, 75 years of decline or so. And I think you'd see the same thing now. If you want to argue that China is declining, you would date the decline to definitely no earlier than the Great Recession, probably maybe 2012-ish when the growth really slowed down, probably more like 2021 when Xi Jinping started making all these policy mistakes and then, you know, with zero COVID and, and the real estate crackdown and then you saw COVID unleashed and, and you know, their, their catch-up growth had basically run out. So if you look at a, a decline, you might want to date it to then. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on a Chinese collapse, but I realized that when you're talking about international affairs, to get anyone to pay attention, you've got to say something very dramatic. And, this is, you know, this is true of me, too. As a blogger, sometimes I have to say something very dramatic sounding to get people to pay attention. So when I wrote about U.S.-China decoupling, my post was called The End of the System of the World. And, like, that's a cool title. I liked it. It was not that it's not actually that dramatic what's happening. You know, there are big changes, but they're not this abrupt, like, giant crack in the earth like the graphic I used for that post. But, uh, you know, you want to get people to, like, pay attention to what's going on and realize you know, that this is a little more important than like, you know, whatever chat bot said yesterday. Or the weather balloons that apparently were owned by a bunch of kids that got shot down, like a $20 balloon got shot down by a half million dollar missile, which is like the funniest story in the history of the world. This is great. I support more of that. Just like shoot down toys with, with fighter jets. You, um, what did you disagree with the, the David Sachs kind of opinion on, on Ukraine or the people who were, um, you know, adver- advocating for restraint or, or disengagement? Well, I mean, so so I don't exactly know what David Sachs is. So I, I, I talked to him pretty extensively. And I think that, you know, um, we agree, he and I agree basically that if, you know, Russia conquers large portions of Ukraine, gets away with it, that's a negative thing because what you've just done is set a precedent saying conquest works, guys. Guess what? Like we had this, this, this interregnum since world war two, this 75 year interregnum where conquest didn't pay off, but now it does again. And you can do that. You can just grab your part of your neighbor's country and, uh, it's on and that's bad. And then, um, obviously if, you know, no one, like no one wants to invade Russia. Um, and if you were to have Russia feel like it's, it's existence is under threat. So now we're going to just launch the nukes. Ah, like that's, we want to avoid that as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm not as panicky as many people. Like, I think people who never had to think about this, uh, you know, before get a little panicky. They're like, oh, my God, they have nukes. Ah, but like we went through a Cold War, guys. We we know how this works. Like, well, that's a th- that's one thing that always struck me is like, I you know, I caught the tail end of the Cold War, particularly the 80s in Miami, where like the threat of Soviet communism was very present because, of course, we were there precisely as the the sort of, uh, part, Dawn, of the part of the Iron Curtain. 
the, the part of the Iron Curtain that actually had good weather. Um, and uh, yes. and right, right, yeah, Red Dawn, the original Red Dawn, which by the way was the be- one of the best films of the eighties. Obviously, the remake was terrible. Um, yeah, no. but uh, yeah, the remake was horrible. Um, like, because the what was the premise? The North Koreans invaded. Yeah, it's like- North America or something. Like, and it came out at the time that the, I think North Korea was having a famine. Like, if they were invade the U.S., it would be for food or something, right? They'd literally go to a McDonald's and order a Big Mac. Yeah. It would be the first. Yeah, they, capture, <laughs> they capture one in and out. It's done. <laughs> it's done. It's over. Yeah, but yeah, no. I, but I, but it's funny. David Sachs is like older than anyone on the show, and yet he, it's like, oh my god, nuclear war. It's like, dude, that you know that was a slow Tuesday in the eighties, but yeah, you're yeah, right. right. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I, I fear nuclear war, but I don't think that like. Anytime someone says, "Well, we've got nukes," blah blah blah, like then we're on the on the edge of the apocalypse. Like that's right. just yeah. So, w- what's your mental model of, of the Cold War today, as, as we think about it, compared to the previous one? You you um you you wrote a piece about this. Well, I think that I mean you know Russia is is around and they're sort of they're sort of beasting, as the kids used to say. They're they're wilding out, um, and they're they're not they. You know, Putin talks about the new Russian empire or whatever, and they have this New Year's special saying, Russia is expanding now. <laughs> no, no. It's, they, they were exposed as incompetent by this Ukraine invasion. Um, even if they managed to eventually hang on to like little pieces of stuff, they wanted the whole country and a much smaller, poorer country with some like, with some like fairly old technology, some like handheld missile launchers and stuff sent by, you know, the United States and Europe managed to kick their butt that was that's a big like that that shows that putin's regime is just not nearly as effective as we thought and that lesson is not going away they sunk their flagship ukraine sunk with a homemade missile that they they themselves manufactured and and made they sunk russia's flagship you don't come back from that in one war you have to rebuild after that like you know anyway so so russia has europe by itself can stand up to russia you know, and and eventually the United States is going to get distracted from this conflict in Europe. We're gonna we're gonna say, okay, Europe, Germany, France, Britain, y'all deal with Russia. We have to deal with China, which is like much insanely more powerful than Russia. Like Russia. Well, but no, I just That's just to take the other side of this, and to be uh, Dan is probably holding his tongue over there, but to be a Zehan Maxi for just a second, and yeah, for the first time in human history to take David Sachs' side of this argument. <laughs> Um, I mean, Europe could stand up to, to Russia, but it isn't. In fact, the bulk of the military aid going out of Ukraine is actually paid by the U.S. And so I've often joked that even me, EU passport holder who uh, pronounces Pivonkor correctly on the previous show, which got mm. many comments, it is still the case that Europe is basically a retirement community inside an amusement park underneath an American military shield. Right? At least the, the last part of that is still, strictly speaking, true. And Terry, you're doing and, my pitch. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> and so if, if, if I mean, so Europe could stand up to Russia, but it, but it actually isn't, right? And so, I mean, maybe Poland actually well, upped they, its defense spending in a real way. Poland, Poland the, also doesn't spend enough of their GDP on military either. Right, but, but let's just take the current argument. Why do we care about Ukraine? Why, why should, the, the, in the Zehan argument, who gives a shit? Like, there's not going to be a Chinese aircraft carrier sailing under the Golden Gate for at least two to three generations. Why do, why do we care about these conflicts? Oh, why because then, the US be because then into people it? just start conquering stuff. But um, they can, they're not coming to us. So what does it matter? We've got the NAFTA right. deal. We have all that. I mean, like the need. United States, this is not, this is definitely not like the 19th century. Even in the 19th century, we actually couldn't be isolated and we were a lot more globalized than anyone realized. But we critically depend on a lot of pieces of the economic system that we have, you know, set up in the world. Like if we are, if, if China becomes the boss of all of Asia and Russia becomes the boss of Europe, I'm not saying I think that's going to happen, but I'm saying if it did, if it did happen, we would be in big trouble, you know, economically and and also militarily. And I think that you could have made the exact same argument in World War II, obviously, right? You could have said, okay, so Japan conquers China. Nazis okay, no, okay, no, but the, but, the, but, the, but the, okay, but guess what? Guess what? But guess what? The World War II example is too simple. You know when that argument was made during Iraq and it was wrong, right? And the whole Iraq. War was a fiasco. That's right. And that same that that same neocon fighting of like, oh my God, what if Iraq takes over the Middle East? Is what justified our more recent war. It was wrong in Vietnam. And Vietnam, for example. Right. So why is well, it right now? Not all. Obviously, not all arguments for intervention are justified. That would be crazy. Like, um, 
yeah, you you know, sometimes things matter and sometimes they don't. One thing that is a really big difference is great powers versus not great powers. So Vietnam was just a bunch of pig farmers and, uh, you know, that posed zero threat to us or anything um, except the Khmer they, they Rouge seem, and they, they toppled, they, which is great. I, I mean, they seem to come off rather well, rather well in the war, by the way, <laughs> for being right, because uh, like the way that you're describing them. Yeah, because, you know, that's it's because the people of Vietnam wanted to be communist and we can't sit there and shoot them until they stop wanting to be communist. That's, it's not a thing that works. And so like, no, no well, Vietnamese one, army. One, could... one can cite countries where that did work, but in any case, let's, <laughs> let's proceed. <laughs> Who, Malaysia? <laughs> anyway, <Chile? laughs> where like most of the Chileans wanted to be communist, like, I mean, well, that's not true. The, the very, I mean, they actually won the won a plurality to roll not the majority, but in any case, exactly. We're getting exactly right. So, yeah. so Chile was a very divided society. Vietnam really was not like everyone in North Vietnam and like two out of three people in South Vietnam wanted to be communist. And because not because of any devotion to Marxist principles, but just because Ho Chi Minh was the guy who kicked out the French, like that's it. And then, the, and, and also because they were a bunch of farmers and farmers want land reform, right? They were like, yeah, give me some, give me some land, man. I'm a farmer. Like, give me my own land. I don't want to pay rent to this landlord. So that's why, by the way, land reform is the biggest inoculation against communism ever. And that's always been true. Uh, but that's another point to make. Um, but but basically, Vietnam was like never any threat to us at all. Iraq was never any threat to us at all. Um, the point is that Russia is not, I mean, they're only, they're like a minor threat to us today unless they use nukes. But they could be more of a threat in the future. And if, if I, I don't think Russia is going to take over Europe. But if Russia did manage to take over Europe, that would be a massive hit to our to our interests and um if china took over asia that would be a that would be really bad for us economically and eventually militarily because you know like eventually the places that our ships are allowed to sail get smaller and smaller and eventually you know eventually it reaches our shores and i think that that's why the argu the argument in world war ii was correct because they saw that germany and japan um uh were powerful enough where if if they were unchecked eventually it would get to be a big problem for us and i think that was right that was correct uh we nipped it in the bud of course hitler helped by by invading the soviet union and etc but um and they were stupid but we we nipped in the bud and that was good um and the system we built was much better for us in the aftermath of the war it was great it's hard to say how we lost out in that situation say, oh, World War II, what a big L for us. No, who says that? No one says that. Like, you have to be sort of, a, uh, Pat Buchanan says that. Because Pat but the, Buchanan- But there's no counterfactual, right? Like, it, it is no, what it, nope. it happened, right? Welcome like, to we history. We didn't run the simulation 10 times. That's right. You never know. Yeah. But, 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 like, but, 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 but Dan, do you, think, do you think World War II was an L for the United States? No, of course not. But I think that the- Why not? Why, the, of course not? Why couldn't we just Because the rest of, of all the developed countries in the world and anyone who had an empire got bombed out. And so as a result, there was only one left standing and you got to decide all the rules. So it's, it's, a, it's a circumstantial okay. thing versus a, a policy. So you think, you think World War II was good because like Britain got destroyed. But Britain would have got destroyed without our without our intervention. And it's not like Japan and Germany could have really hung on to like the Soviet, the, all of Asia, like they were small. Um, like there's, there's, you know, I think it's it's probably not worth wargaming World War II again. I, I think it right. is worth noting that the World War II is actually a super hard sell on the American people. It was a very hard sell. And and Lendley's was a hard sell. I, I see, think yeah. Henry Ford didn't want to join it. Yeah, let, let, let's well, he, Ford, he had his really own reasons. Did, Henry Ford. Henry Ford, e, the Elon Musk of the twenties, truly. Uh, uh mm, I don't know about that. I think Elon Musk doesn't come out. Wouldn't uh, appreciate that, that that comparison. I think more interesting is the bear case on your China domination story. Here's my bear case for the for Chinese imperialism. Why do you, a, if you didn't like be, if you didn't want to be Henry Ford? Why do you name his car the Model S? He was that was uh, obviously an homage to Ford. Like, you know, it, Elon uh, Elon uh, obviously wanted to be the the modern day Henry Ford in terms of making the car company that revolutionized blah blah blah. Right and and yeah. yeah. Anyway, the point is that there is a parallel here, and the parallel is that America is naturally isolationist because of our geography, and you know because we don't have close cultural connections with these other countries. Um, but it, and it is a hard sell to tell Americans that getting embroiled in in these Eurasian conflicts is in our interest. 
Um, but I think that it sometimes is in our interest. And the okay, sometimes just, uh, is when there's other great powers involved. That's why uh, Vietnam okay, but, was not a big deal. Let, let, let's let okay. Dan jump in. Sorry, my mic cut out. I got so excited I hit the mute button on it and I couldn't figure out why I couldn't speak. Um, I, look, I think World War II obviously is a, a massive success for the U.S. The, like massive loss of human life, like a ter- terrible th- tragedy. But I think I think the to, to compare though, like where we are today, like China China has no history in its its you know longest civilization, continuous civilization potentially in in history of any external uh, kind of projection. It's always been an internal culture, right? What about Tibet? And, oh, come on. Like the, the, what about like the invasion of Vietnam in 1979? Like it is barely has done anything compared to Japan or, or, or you know, name all the great empire powers. Like it, it has no no history of that. China's and then invading I think Vietnam in terms Russia, it's just like it's it's a decaying and dying society. There's there is everyone has what, like China? bronchitis or you know tuberculosis or whatever in, in that country. Wait, China, like, I think the point Dan is making is the point I was gonna make, by the way, is that Chinese no, 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 by nature actually Russia, an imperial Russia. society, right? Like it's to be an imperial society, you have to be a universalizing society that in some sense ingests yes. external cultures, which which Russia does, by the way. You'll note that many are actually not non ethnic Russians are actually fighting in Ukraine. And that that's exactly what the Roman Empire was as well, the United States. France, I mean, Britain fought, uh, a lot of in- uh, Indians actually fought on the British side in World War II. You, you have to have a universalizing ability to ingest outside powers and make them part of your worldview. And the Han Chinese have historically never done that. And it's it's not the case we're in a new Cold War. Like, again, my, my parents literally fled Cuba. You had, you had literally people living in the tropical climate who wanted to emulate the Soviet model. Nobody wants to emulate the Chinese model. I mean, African nations might do business with them and have their infrastructure products underwritten with Chinese capital. But you know, I, I doubt very much that the elites in sub-Saharan Africa, other parts of the world, are sending their children to Tsinghua University instead of Cambridge University or Harvard. Right. They're simply not, right? right. And so we're, we're not in a new Cold War in the way that we were with the Soviet Union, which you, you actually had a different world order, a different way of viewing the entire world, and the world was divided into camps. That is kind of not the case with China. So again, well, so harping think, back yeah. on the Zahan argument, why do we care about it? They're, they're never going to divide the world. It, it's never yeah. going to be the Soviet Union again. Wait, so you think if they're they're not exporting ideology, it's not a real Cold War? You, totally, Absolutely. of course, yeah. Oh, well, it's like they're not even they're, they're not even okay. the biggest power in Asia from a cultural standpoint. It's like Japan and South Korea are are, are bigger cultural exporters than than China. Yeah, but the point is I mean, that I mean, you know, I don't have to day, tell you that. Like you, you... so so if you I mean, look the, at the day we have like Thai refugees living in LA because they fled a Chinese, you know, a native. Thai revolution that wanted to emulate the Chinese model, and suddenly we have Thai exiles taking over, you know, elections in LA like the Cubans did in Miami. Then I'd be like, okay, this is really a Cold War. We're really dividing the world in two. That that's that's not the case. Okay, what about what about our our economies are so embedded? What about Myanmar? We've got refugees from there. What what about it? Uh, There, it's a Chinese supported, yeah, sort of militarist government there, and we've got refugees. But. But like, okay, but their GDP is smaller than the two buildings next to me in Soma. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 yeah, I don't, was, yeah okay, true. but it's hard I to mean, care how big, about that. I think it was Cuba's GDP in, in 60, whatever. But like, I don't know, like take the game, take the, the board game Twilight Struggle. It's literally a global game where every single country like has like, there, there, there's some event that actually happened during the Cold War where there was either Russian or Americans like trying to muck with the country. It's like, it was a global stage. One Belt, One Road, it's like they're already, people are defaulting on their payments. It, it is like not even close to the the, the Soviet Empire. Well, that's sort of true. I mean, the Soviets didn't like build a ton of infrastructure, a little bit. Mostly, they just like gave money from their oil revenues to people, or like yeah, ships. But some but weapons. they were in play in every country. Every country was the, the the CIA and the KGB. Like it was like, who who was fighting over like this politician versus that politician. Yeah. So you know, I mean, I don't think that that the Cold War with China is going to look exactly like the Cold War with with Russia, with Soviet Union, was. It will look different. Um, not all Cold Wars look the same. Not all wars look the same, really. Like World War One and World War Two didn't even look the same. Um, but like, uh, yeah. So I, I think it's there's going to be big differences. But the um, the idea of this 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 protracted enmity between the, the great powers where they both sort of like have a military build up to counter each other and both try to get other countries on their side to get a system of alliances and blah, 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 and sort of threaten each other. And I think that's going to happen. If you don't want to call that a Cold War, go crazy. You know, that's fine. 
but because they're not because China doesn't isn't really ideological. But like if you look at World War II versus World War One, World War II was highly ideological, right? You had communism and fascism and these these ideologies. Maybe not in Asia, but in Europe it certainly was. And then whereas in World War One it wasn't there was no ideology involved. It's just like you're Germany, you're France, we're going to kick your butt, and it, you know it was just uh, it was pure sort of power politics. So I I don't think these things have to be ideological, but if you if you want to insist that a cold war requires ideology, then then don't call it a cold war. But it's going to be there's going to be like military buildup and spies and balloons getting shot down and you know jockeying for alliances with all these third party countries and there's going to be warships sliding past each other and wondering if they're going to fire on each other and all this this stuff. You know, China just decided like oh we're gonna we're gonna increase our nuclear weapons arsenal to 900 900 warheads. There's a thing they said the other day, nuclear buildup. It looks like a cold war to me, I, you know, I don't know. Um, let's, uh, let, let's shift gears here. We, we've, we've covered this it was, um, enough. Sorry. Um, no, no, no. I didn't mean to beat you, that to death. No, no, no. I, I was a good conversation. Yeah, it was a good topic. Um, Noah, uh, you've written a bit about the, the new right and how you don't like the new right because they don't have a good economic plan or a coherent economic plan. They don't like immigration. They don't like cities. You've also recently tweeted a couple months ago how you were worried that tech is getting less progressive. Um, and so I'm curious if you could unpack perhaps both uh, both statements and then let's let's have a discussion about it. Right. So it's it's hard to talk about the new right as a single unified entity, right? Because you've got um you've got people like um you know, Palmer Lucky is a guy who's like supposed to be on the right, but he's very like pro Ukraine. Then you've got other guys who are who are on the right who are very like anti Ukraine. Uh, so that you know divides people. Um, you've got people who are more like uh, you know pro institutionalist. You know, let's go U.S. military. You have others who are like, now nah, the military's woke. It's you know, write it off. Like let's have a guerrilla war against the libs. People. Um, you've got inc- incredibly radically different ideas on the right in America. I think ultimately it goes back to the failure in the Bush years. So in, in, in the Bush years, three things happened at the same time. Number one, laissez-faire economics sort of crashed the economy through the financial sector in 2008. Number two, the Iraq war was a big debacle and nobody liked it. Although we won, we won that war, but it didn't get us anything. It was, you know, um, it was, everybody agreed it was a debacle. Um, and then, uh, and the third one was that sort of Christianity started to decline and then and then a lot of, you know, some conservative Christians went all in on stopping gay marriage and failed and gay marriage won and succeeded and gay people were mainstreamed. And that was a big L for them at, at the same time that Christianity started to decline. And so sort of the three pillars of what we called conservatism in the 80s, you know, this, this muscular defense posture, laissez-faire economics and conservative Christianity all sort of stumbled at the same time. And I think that created a, a sort of a vacuum where a lot of people on the right started arguing and a, and a ferment of new ideas. And you had some, you know, some, you had Nazis, you had Charlottesville. That was, that was called the Unite the Right rally. They failed to unite the right, but th- that's what they were thinking about, right? And so you had Nazis in there, but you had a lot of other people. You had just, you know, you had, you had people like, um, you know, Orrin Cass coming on, uh, you know, um, he's a, he's a friend of mine. He's a good guy. Uh, you know, he's um, coming along. He, he had sort of new economics ideas, not that anyone necessarily listened to them, but you had um, you had a lot of, of new ideas um, coming off out of the right, some of which were things I really don't like, and some of which were things that, you know, I do like, um, or at least were, were better. You know, I'm not on the right myself, but I can still have preferences about what the right does and doesn't do. And so I think that you saw a lot of people arguing, and I think um, you know Antonio. You're you're sort of generally perceived as as being on the political right, but I'd say that I've seen you arguing with people on the political right all day long, and I think that that's a good example. That's that's emblematic of what I've seen everywhere. I think it, you know in the tech industry, I think is mirroring a lot of other knowledge industries where people felt that the sort of um, uh, very militant leftward push of the 2010s kind of went too far, and now there's retrenchment. And so that's that's a, a pretty standard story. You see the New York Times doing the same thing, right? New York Times. Um, but anyway, let's not talk about that. Uh, but you, um, but but 
you see in a lot of places this sort of retrenchment, and I think that looks like the 1970s. But the question is, what will what will emerge from the right? What will the new idea from the right be? In the 1970s, you had this thing called conservatism emerge, which did not start then. You know, Barry Goldwater sort of brought it together and all that stuff. But it was, um, you know, this like muscular muscular nationalism combined with laissez-faire economics, you know, and supply side economics and sort of conservative Christianity, the Christian revival, the the um, fourth great awakening, if you will, uh, all happened. You know, th- that was the package that Reagan embodied and that George W. Bush later embodied less effectively, um, but that Reagan embodied and was wildly popular and that and that Newt Gingrich to many people embodied. Um, that was that. What comes next? I don't see a unified... I, I've seen a lot of ferment and arguments on the right, but I haven't seen a unified thing come out of it. And what people are calling the new right is not cohesive enough and not complete enough in terms of its ideas to become the next Reaganism, the next conservative revolution. I, I disagree, Noah. So I, I have I have thoughts on the new right here. And in Go fact, uh, there's, You'd know there's been a piece... Than me. Here, I'll I, there's been a piece I've been... I, there's been a piece I've been meaning to write on it that, of course, now that I have a company, I'm, I'm never going to write it. But... I, I do think the new right is it. I think there is a new right. Um, I think it's weird that you lump in Orrin Cass in with like the Nazis of pure one imports over there. I don't. That was the whole point. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. The point is that like but many conservatives Cass is like a very in norm- different directions. Okay. I'm okay. saying okay. he couldn't I mean, be more different. No, I, I, I use those as a contrast to say, look okay. how different these people right, are. Right. Look, okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Look well, how much okay. diversity but, and difference and okay, disagreement there is. I mean, Charlottesville was like 50 people and, and obviously yeah, horrible, yeah, but nonetheless, say, yeah. Okay. Okay, so the new right thing. The reason why I think it's interesting, I, I think you are. Right, I think you are right to highlight that the right, as it's been construed for the past thirty years, has fundamentally changed, and it was, and it was sort of seated around. I mean, obviously the strong defense part, uh, posture, but I, I think it's more what what Yoram Hazoni, for example, who organizes like the preeminent conference of this new right called the National Conservative Conference that I've been to twice as a journalist. Um, he would call it fusionism, right? The fusion between like sort of like chamber of commerce, Reagan Republicanism, small government, low taxes, pro-business. And then, yeah, some level of social conservatism, but it was still kind of in the private sphere. I think the difference with the new right is that they feel, A, they're not necessarily so pro-capitalist or so pro-corporate. Like in this, in my unpublished piece about the national conservative, in fact, Orrin Koss actually in, in two national conservative conferences ago, gave this whole pro-labor speech about unions yes. and you know respect for labor. And in like, in, in many of the speeches you were to quote them, you think it's like an old school Berkeley hippie talking about, you know, union organization. In fact, it's actually the new right talking about it. Right. So they're, they're not necessarily pro-corporate at all. I think the, the interesting thing about the, what is new about the new right, and you're right that it's totally fractious and you go to these conferences and it's like this weird circus of like Catholic integralists and traditionalists, yes. whatever. And then like people like Ron DeSantis who gave a speech there, which was obviously a preface for a stump speech that he's going to give because he's going to run, in which he doesn't met, you know mention Jesus or God or anything even once in the entire speech. And he literally just talks through what he considers to be his policy triumphs in Florida for the past four years. But I, I think what's different about the new right is, A, it's somewhat anti-capitalist or at least not pro-corporate by default. And two, they're very comfortable with using state power to affect their agenda. Right? Like this notion of like, oh, the right has to be hands off and conservative and small government. That is over, right? Like it, you can you can tell in terms of DeSantis and what he's doing in Florida, he's happy to promulgate a certain view of the world and actually have and use state power to have to implement that that state policy. And I think that's where it's very different than say a Reagan. Although to be clear, Reagan in private, of course, did do all sorts of things. He wasn't nearly as hands off as uh, you know he sort of claimed to be. But at least the the public rhetoric was was that of the right was the sort of you know government is not your friend. What, what was this famous line? Like the worst lines in the English language are "I'm from the government, I'm here to help you," right? Like. He obviously always struck Seriously. a very strong at the government stance, and that's not yeah. the case with the, with the new right. But I agree with you that like it's not clear to me that there's the makings of a right revolution there. But I think if if you look, a lot of it obviously to be clear is just very re- rejectionist. Well, we reject we reject what they perceive to be the woke left, whatever, right? And that is kind of what they're rejecting. But you know what, Reagan Republicanism was a rejection of Carter leftism of the time, right? And so often in the rejection of some culture. And, and 60s hippie culture. So in, but in the rejection it, but it of something else. at least had else, beat the Soviets, right? It had, it had some right. unifying thing to go do, but the right doesn't have that now. Right. Um, yeah. That's no, just They don't think we're in a Cold War. They don't. I, I, I would quibble with your economic thing. I mean, it's... it's Which one? Bill Clinton was as laissez-faire, right? Oh, yeah, because, right, bubble. because he's triangulating. Right, but but, but to, to blame that on Bush, that, that it's a continual thing. It was it was both sides. No, I'm not blaming. And, and, I'm blaming it on Clinton. 
Like the point is that the ideas, like the the financial deregulation that ultimately led to the 2008 crisis, did not happen under George W. Bush. It happened under Bill Clinton. It was in right. the Commodity Futures Modernization Act. Bernie yep. Sanders voted for it. Yep. And no, so. No, no, no. That was what crashed our economy. It was Bernie Sanders and Bill Clinton working together for neoliberal. Uh, make make that the Twitter clip, Eric. Yeah. So um, thanks, Bernie. But anyway, and then and that's I, I really think that the, the Bernie people always talk about glass, the Glass-Steagall repair, the Gla- Graham Leach Bliley repeal of Glass-Steagall. They always say this is what did it. This is what did it. No. It was something else. It was the Commodity Futures Modernization Act that Bernie voted in favor of. That was a million times more important in terms of 2008 and the real estate. Yeah, all the derivatives were unregulated. They, people wanted to add the regulation to them, and they just were all kind of dark. Yes. And Antonio contributed to the downfall of the economy at that point. Oh, thanks, Antonio. Very small junior way, but it's true. Um, yes, I blame yeah. Antonio. <laughs> no, no you, you have a theory on how wokeness is going to play out in the 2020s. Can you share that theory? Yeah, so um, wokeness is first of all my theory of wokeness is that it's a it's it's not a communist thing that came from Europe, Frankfurt School, whatever stuff like that. It came from America and it has been in America since the beginning of America. It started out with uh, Congregationalist abolitionism. Um, you get all these uh, basically woke white kids would sit around listening to black preachers about why slavery is bad and be like, yes, we're going to take down slavery. And then the abolitionist movement, um, you know, dovetailed with a lot of other social reform movements like prison reform and whatnot. And so you, uh, the, the, the term woke doesn't necessarily harken back to this, but there was a group of, of people called the wide awakes in the North who were abolitionists and who used the term wide awake in exactly the term that in exactly the way people would later come to use the term woke, which means I am aware of the injustice in society. I, I see the injustice all around me and you are all asleep and you don't see the injustice all around you. And so they were militant reformers who would march in the street and blah, blah, blah. And this, you know, and of course the 1960s were another eruption of this, this sort of idea. This is, is it's a very old American Protestant derived religion. And if you read people like John McWhorter, who is, you know, anti-woke, he correctly describes wokeness as derived from Protestantism. You know, it's um, it's not derived from communism, it's derived from Protestantism, which Protestantism in its day was a very radical transformative ideology in North Europe in the, uh, you know, 1600s, 1700s. And it, um, and I think in America, it evolved um, into, you know, what we call wokeness in, in many ways. Um, and so... That's my theory, and and that wokeness will be suppressed and kind of go to sleep, and then it will awaken again some other time, maybe in fifty years or something like that. We'll have another outpouring of wokeness um, again. So it's this recurring thing in America, and I think that at right now, what's happening is that a lot of the 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 sort of vital center of American intellectual culture, which is college kids, young people on internet forums, that's new, I guess. But it used to be like broadsheets, pamphlets, local organizations, um, you know, to some degree, like journalists and pundits and, you know, not really academics. They, they sort of they're later. Um, they're old. They're stodgy. But then the the, the vital center of American uh, ideology of these young kids who are sitting there talking to each other about how everything needs to change. We need a big revolution, overthrow the institutions. Dan, you might like them. They, they want to overthrow all the institutions, replace them with other stuff. Um and uh, that Dan just wants to like Dan just wants to overthrow Twitter. He, he, I think, broadly speaking, he's not an anti-institutionalist. He's no, not I, I, I think I'm an anti-institutionalist. Not, Are you institutionalist? I was going to ask yeah, Noah yeah. if he's an institutionalist. I think he's an institutionalist. But sorry, to interrupt Noah. Go ahead. I am a pragmatist who who you know thinks sometimes he, he's reform versus you know throw them away. Yeah, some sometimes you need one, sometimes you need the other. I'm you know let's uh, I, I I I'm a pragmatist on this. I'm a pragmatist on most things when it comes to like nation building and blah, blah, blah. I don't have this. I don't have like, you know, I I'm, I'm liberal in general, but I'm like, I don't just think I'm going to write out the principles of liberalism and then send my armies of, of soldiers to go enforce these things. Like I think building a liberal society is very hard and we don't know quite how to do it yet. And so we're sort of crossing the river by feeling the stones. And anyway, that's, that's another tangent, but, but I guess that wokeness is, is dying down at the center. At the, at the vital center of, of thought. Um, you don't see a lot of 
you don't see as many young people interested in the ideas of 2015, Inter- interested in like canceling everybody and like, you know, attacking college guest speakers and and devising like new terms to apply to everything and all the stuff we associate with wokeness in 2015. Um, you just don't see it that much anymore. And I think that um, the the Floyd protests of 2020 were a bit of a were, were a bit of a, a, a trick. They, they they tricked people in some ways because it was um, it looked like like this gigantic um, outpouring that would herald you know this major change in society. But I think that it was kind of this a a extremely large last gasp on on the part of young people. Um, exacerbated. I think, we, I think what you're saying. Obama. I think what you're saying now is that wokeness was a zero interest rate, interest rate, <laughs> interest rate phenomenon, right? Yes, sort of. Yes. But, DEI was definitely a bull market phenomenon. Let me tell you that. <laughs> right. But then, but, but yeah. now what you see, yes. And so, so there is, there is that, right. And, and so corporations are becoming less woke. You saw Netflix sort of uh, crack down on some of the woker people and Netflix. You saw a lot of these things happen. Um, I don't know. Google fired some people. I don't know. It's, it's, it's around, but I think, where you see wokeness continue to advance is in the old stodgy people who are very late to get the message with everything. Right. And this would include Columbia med school, or this includes some school board out in Iowa that's having a fight over textbooks or something. And you see like a, like a prairie fire, it's burned out at the center. uh, And then at the edges is still burning. When I say the edges, I mean the, the, all the stodgy old people throughout America who are very late to get the message still think it's like 2016. Because they're the late adopters, right? And it's late like, adopters. it's like a, a but by the time that like normies have a luxury brand, it's no longer a luxury brand. It's like the wokeness is no longer the status signifier. Exactly. One question the I did want to have for you, Noah. Yeah. Is I, so, I mean, you're mentioning that this is like a sublimated religious uh, strain, which I think it is. It is Protestantism, yeah. which, and, you know, one of the pieces of evidence for that is that some of the biggest enemies of wokeness from the earliest days were actually either Jewish or Catholic publications who came from a very different intellectual world for whom this whole business of like basically going insane every 50 years and some weird messianic revival apocalypse is not in fact the default behavior. Um, which brings up the the reality, you know, do you think religion is coming back? And and more specifically, I'm going to put on my Habadnik hat for a second. Have you put on tefillin today, Noah? Are you, are you Jewish? <laughs> no, I, 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 don't, I don't do religion. You don't do um, religion. Although you were raised reform, if I'm I was ra- I, I was raised reform, yeah. That's right. And then I, I basically gave it up. Um, so I, I, may, no... I may become religious in my old age, so... Wait for it. Okay. Do you think we'll religion see. is a good thing or can be a good thing, Noah? Yeah, of course. People need meaning in their life. How do you find meaning, Noah? Other than meaning. Substack subscriptions. Petting rabbits. Substack subscriptions give no meaning. They, um, rabbits. Rabbits, man. Um, I, I think that, I just, that meaning... Um, I, I have never wanted for, for meaning in life. I've always felt that my life was extremely meaningful. Um, and essentially the meaning comes from trying to take care of other people. That's, that's where meaning comes from. For me, it's, um, you know, rabbits are a great pet if you want to like take care of something, right? If you want to like, rabbits need protecting from a lot of things in the world. And so you can protect them and, and you can take care of them and give them all the stuff they need. Um, and they eat constantly. So the, the, the Jewish mother in me really appreciates that I can always just feed rabbits more veggies because it's. You know, it's not like you're going to overeat, overfeed them and, and, and kill them. You know, they're, they're like, oh, veggies. Yeah, it's, it's great. I love it. Anyway, um, but meaning, you know, meaning comes from human relationships, comes from, you know, your friends and your family and all these things. Uh, and that that's ultimately where meaning comes from. And and I'm going to say something re- ready for my conservative uh, 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 thing here. Most of the people looking for meaning in life from politics will not find it. Instead, they would find meaning from having kids. See this? Noah goes trad. Holy fuck. Trad! Yeah. Wow. Yes, I'm, 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 I'm not pronatalist in the sense that I want like, you know, jackbooted thugs to go out and make people have kids. No, I'm, I'm pronatalist in the sense that I think that a lot more people than realize it would be happy having kids. Like, it, Yeah, but then they can't do the trips that they put on Instagram and tell all their friends where they're going. Deep fake it, man. AI. <laughs> Wait, so Noah, I mean, you're, you're into American dynamism. You're an economist. You, um, you know, is a pronatalist. Yeah. How are you? How are you liberal? <laughs> or how are you progressive? On, on, on I want to give poor people all my money, man. <laughs> I want to like, like, you know, give the poor people the money. 
<laughs> like the poor people need so, the money. Sorry, so how do you do that? What's, what's the yeah, policy? So, You're a dictator tomorrow. How do you give people money? No, no. Let's let's just get more specific, Dan. What fraction of your sub sub prescriptions go to poor people right now? <laughs> uh, well, I gave a bunch of free ones out. <laughs> Wait, and which I appreciate, by the way, Noah, because I was actually looking at my Substack subs, and I realized you had given me a lifetime membership, and so thank you for that, Noah. There you go. I um I gave I gave my top two hundred reply guys on Twitter a uh, a free subscription. That could go both ways. That one. Wait, wait uh, well, can we go back? What 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 is the policy initiative that you would encourage? You're dictator tomorrow, and you want to help people. What would you implement? Well, I mean, just stuff with with you know, supply side progressivism kind of stuff as recline Derek Thompson stuff, build more stuff, you know, like, um, build all the, all the housing, build all the energy stuff, just build, build, build. Um, I would do all that stuff and I'm, I'm reasonably agnostic as to how that gets done. Obviously, you know, in some cases we need like permitting reform. We, you know, I'm for public housing. I think the government should like build a bunch of housing, public housing, go for it, you know, um, do that. And, um, so that's that would be my my first focus. I also really like uh, cash benefits, sort of giving people m- cash instead of you know saying like, okay, well if you make this much income and if you stay off drugs and if you have this right hairstyle, then we'll give you a housing voucher that you can only use on this kind of housing. Stop that! No, no, just give people a check, mail people a check. And there was this idea, you know, sort of part of the Reagan revolution was this idea that people are going to misuse government money. If people get a check, they're going to use it to buy drugs and they're going to use it to buy booze and they're going to use it, whatever, right? They're going to waste it all. No, it, all the evidence we have shows people don't waste it. People actually, you know, use it to avoid the trials and tribulations that affect poor people all day, you know? And, um, and so, uh, so that's what I do. You know, the, the child tax credit, the expanded child tax credit. I love that. I was very sad when we canceled that. Um, you know, but no, didn't... what you're describing is the welfare regime we've had for 40 years. Would you look at that more broadly and no. consider that to be a stunning success? We have a work. Well, first of all, uh, there's been a substantial success in terms of reducing poverty. Um, but then second of all, we, what we have in America is a patchwork of in-kind workfare benefits where you get a specific good in exchange for doing specific things in your life. And it is just hellish to navigate. Instead, I say, give people a check. It's so much simpler. Think how much government administrative stuff you could save, administrative burden you could save just by cutting a check instead of having like a massive bureaucracy to like certify that you were jumping through all the hoops to get this money. Anyway. No, no, so what me, about earned income tax credit? So earned income tax credit, it's, it, it's, it's better than other programs because ultimately it functions just like cash. Right. But you have to have a job because otherwise, if you're just giving people checks, they're going to be plenty. That's we it. just saw this during COVID. People won't go to work and then you're going to have all these these shortages. And they're going to be trading stocks on Robinhood and, and you know, doing whatever they're doing with the stimmy checks. Well, there is a bit of that, but uh, there is a bit of Robinhood trading. But um, people, some people are going to do stupid things with their cash. But um, earned income tax credit, I think we should eliminate that phase in. So we give everybody, you know, if you can't work, even if you but, don't but we already have work, that. We already have disability. And it's actually Republican states have higher rates of disability, you know, people on permanent disability than than blue states. It's probably because they have more obesity. Anyway, um, so I, I think uh, that it's correlated, right? It's like Alabama yeah. and Mississippi and those places. Twenty five percent in some counties. It's incredible. Yeah. We basically already have a UBI. Like like everything in America, we always end up building the thing, but always in the most wasteful and least efficient way possible. So we basically yes. have UBI. It's just called, let's let's it's let's just call this SDI. It. And we basically um, we already have public health care. It's called the emergency room. You can't get turned away at an American hospital. In Latin America. That's super anyways, inefficient yeah. by the. And you're waiting till people have like an emergency to like their foot has to be sawed off, man. Like, yeah, but you shouldn't go to the ER for like, yeah, a busted. If, you had, a- if you had, if you had healthcare, everyone had access to a primary care physician. How many people would actually go on a regular basis? They wouldn't, right? Like, the They're reason we have obesity is because people like they choose to have terrible diets. I mean, yeah, but doctors and, and like people trying to make arguments that it's more expensive or whatever. It's like, come on. Yeah, um, I mean, obesity is a public health issue. It's not going to be solved by doctors. I'm sorry. Unless we get, unless magic drugs like semaglutide become really cheap and everybody can just do that forever. But, um, so what we need in healthcare, we need a national health insurance system that pays 70% of all costs uh, for everybody. And people can get, unless you're, unless you're poor or unless you're really old, uh, you can get, um, and I mean like pretty old, like not like 65, you can get, uh, and you'll have, you'll have private insurance for the rest. That is the system Japan uses. That is the system Korea uses. The national health uh, insurance system will keep costs way down. 
you know, that because it can it can basically negotiate away monopoly power um, by vendors. And, you know, you won't have those like thousand dollar hospital pillows anymore. Um, that is, yeah, but, that but, is waste. but like let's, if, if we actually dig into that, like I don't yeah. think that there's any institutional capacity in the United States to go to the AMA and say increase the number of doctors. Right. Like there are plenty of qualified people who would want to actually go be a doctor. And instead they limit the number of slots because it protects doctor salaries. And so it's just like it's just like a big complex problem, right? It's like employer yeah, a, a national based healthcare health insurer... is, a, is a tax benefit that never got taken oh, away and unions liked it. Sure. But a national health insurer will have the power to bust through a lot of that red tape that currently no one has that power. Medicare is the closest thing we have. And what we do see is that Medicare um is that Medicare gets much cheaper prices for the exact same service than private insurers, and only about a third of that is cost, sh cost shifting onto private insurers, that basically two thirds of the price advantage Medicare has is from Medicare just negotiating better. Because it's a unified single big negotiator, it can do that. That's a that's encouraging system on which to build. So I'd make a national health insurance system like Japan's or Korea's, which do a great job holding down cost. I do that tomorrow. And, um, and you can also use that system to put pressure on like, you know, doctor cartels to, to hire more doctors, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so you absolutely do that. Um, but yeah, the, didn't, uh, didn't, yeah. didn't they pass like a law? I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but wasn't there a law in place until recently? Maybe even Trump got rid of it. It was like you couldn't Medicare couldn't even negotiate with drug companies. Oh, uh, yes, that's right. That's it was good that they got rid of that. Right, but but like you just but you know that like whatever version things, of a national healthcare system that's going to go in place, it's going to just be totally rife with with like corruption from the the graft of lobbying. Like, but wait, I just don't have any confidence would ever pass something that would be effective. Didn't you just talk about us passing a bill that allowed Medicare to negotiate with drug companies, and isn't that a good sign? Right, but after after it had existed on the books for years of just like letting letting all the the kind of you know inflation of costs and all that because they weren't allowed to do it it sounds like you're complaining that things got better and smarter no but i mean it's like because the system already was terrible so it's like it got like marginally better it's, it went from like a one to a two but it wasn't that terrible because medicare was always negotiating for other stuff that wasn't drugs it was just that thing it couldn't negotiate and now it can which is a huge cost cost driver of of all of it right drugs I don't know. I, I I just I'm I'm just very skeptical that there's going to be any institution put into the federal level that is going to do anything to reduce cost and, and make things more efficient. But but I mean like Medicare I already maybe does. there's a counterfactual. No, Medicare. I mean look it 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 it's it's the best thing that exists to actually try to drive some cost savings in the sense that it's a big thing. But yeah, in of thing. itself, there's no profit incentive there. No, there's no profit incentives. It's just uh, cost minimization. Can I ask you a question, Noah, that is related to this issue that I've always wanted to ask as uh, someone who's smarter about economics than I am? So here's here's some of my theories, and you have the wide ranging intellect, and you'll come up with a snappy answer in a second. Here's, um, yeah, yeah, probably it's probably and if not, you you probably have a Substack post about it. Um, so um, one thing I've always found, given that I'm the sort of cranky, occasional European who criticizes American culture, one thing I've always found about American culture is that um, Americans are great at coping, right? Like they're always great at like weaving some like marketing narrative around what is like some shittiness, frankly, of America. Like, I believe in American exceptionalism, to be clear. I think it's an exceptional nation in, along many dimensions. And broadly speaking, like, I don't think default the U.S. should be doing things like other countries by and large. But but it, it's exceptionally good at some things and exceptionally shitty at other things. And I think, the, it, like, like look at immigration policy, for example, like the fact that the United States ingests so many immigrants, myself included, etc., I think is great. But seen another way, it's like, hmm, are Americans so dumb and lazy they have to constantly import people to actually do all their work and all their thinking because they can't do it themselves? Right. Like, so that, that's like the counter narrative on, on a lot of it. So one thing I've often had, one thing American sort of analysts of policy often do is um, they invent universal phenomenon for what are uniquely American failings. Right. So like like what we're discussing here, that like the U.S. just cannot run an even remotely efficient public health care system. And I think Dan is right, to be clear. Like, I think it's just not going to happen. But it's like it's because the American public sector is so fucked up. Like it, it's not like or some other example that would that would please your economist's heart, Balmol's cost disease, right? Like, oh, why is why is the cost of schooling in the United States so so fucking expensive that it literally costs, you know, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to send your kid to like a four year Ivy League college? It's like, oh, Balmol's cost disease. It's like, okay, but apparently the force field of Balmol only Oh, he's only exerted in North America. Guess what? In Europe, it doesn't happen. And in fact, if you look at that plot that everyone plots of like the cost of housing, healthcare, and schooling, basically everything that matters in life, but it's gone off the fucking scale, a similar plot in other comparable countries wouldn't look that way, right? Like there's something uniquely fucked up about the way 
the U.S. actually administers lots of common goods that makes it end up in this bizarre end state. Do you agree with that general take on it? And if so, what is it about the United States that makes it such that we have, you know, almost cost disease when it comes to education and not anywhere else? Well, I agree with most of that. The one exception is that Baumol's cost disease is actually something else. So Baumol's cost disease just says that as a society gets more productive, labor becomes more expensive. So labor intensive stuff becomes more expensive. So Baumol's cost disease can explain all of the increase in K through 12 education and relatively little of the much greater increase in healthcare and higher education. So there's something screwed up going on. Am I allowed to curse on this podcast? Yes. Okay, there's something deeply fucked about our, um, you know, like college tuition, but especially healthcare and childcare that we don't see happening at the K through 12 level. K through 12 costs just go up with wages. That's just, that's just like, it, it tracks productivity growth, but, um, which track tracks wages better than people realize. But, um, but the the excess cost the purely american cost disease goes far beyond baumol actually scott alexander had a good post about this um and then uh you know in some areas like uh, infrastructure construction uh housing construction um health care child care and to some degree higher education though less than people realize um baumol's cost disease uh it cannot explain the cost drivers that we've seen and it, right, it the infrastructure really is exceptional i was, I was gonna say the infrastructure bad. costs in the united states are incredibly high to the point like, again like what explains the fact that and again i wouldn't hold up spain as an example for much but barcelona has a better metro system or train system than any america that american cities can only dream of right in a, in a country with a gdp per capita less than half the united states right, right. and, and, and the like, city the city that can build the subway it's what a billion dollars per mile for the second avenue subway or some insane thing right like, in right, New York, like, it's like 10x almost the cost yeah. in europe and w- I, <laughs> I was, and again, Americans are saying, well, it's just impossible to build trains. And of course, it's not fully true. I mean, just to stick the finger in the eye of California even more, uh, Florida has high, be- high speed rail and California does not, and pro- more, more than likely never will um, for a bunch of reasons. Although some will claim that it's not quite high speed. Yeah, but speed your high speed rail is going to get attacked by zombies. Uh, okay, is that right? Well, Florida man, at least. There's definitely going to be. Um, Florida man. There's already. There's, well, there's already been a number of deaths on the on the high speed rail in Florida, actually, um, well. unfortunately. But yeah. But in any case, um, what is it? Yeah. So what is it? How, what, who, even even Tyler Cohen, who I respect a lot, and one of his shows said, you know, I just can't explain this infrastructure thing. Like, I just don't understand. Do you have a theory now? Well, there's a there's a couple factors, but the main theory is just local control. It's just the idea that in the 70s, we do, used to not have this problem, but sometime around 1970s, we decided that we were going to farm out everything to local people and that localism was how we wanted to go. Uh, you see this with NEPA, uh, for example, the National Environmental Policy Act, which basically allows you to sue people to say you haven't checked the environmental laws carefully enough. Please spend another couple of years checking it. So that's NEPA. But there's a lot of things like this uh, where basically anyone can sue uh, and and file other administrative procedural things to stop um, anyone from constructing anything. And the more we look at the infrastructure cost problem, the more we see this crop up again and again, this issue of local control. Americans have a sentimental attachment to the idea of local control. We have this very sentimental attachment to this idea that our community doesn't want a highway through that, you know, and like communities should decide what's best for them, blah, blah, blah. But when you're building infrastructure, it goes across many different communities and you have to take into account the interests of many communities, not just one local one. And so... We have essentially engaged in, we have farmed out our regulatory policy to localities to a large degree. And what you have is nimbyism everywhere where people just block anything. This, I'm not saying this is all of our problem because there's other problems too, but this is a big part of it. And this is what differentiates us from a lot of other countries. There are other countries with some NEPA-like laws, but they curbed their power a lot because they were starting to get abused in similar ways. Uh, the United States did not curb ours. And remember, NEPA is only one facet of this local control issue. And so basically, that's my, that's not the whole answer, but that's the first place to look. 
So, so my question to you is, so if you take like a state like California, which has its own, what is CEQA, like uh, California yeah. Environmental Quality Act on top yeah. of the, the federal stuff, right? And right. so basically you can't build in California as a result of that. Oh, you know, it takes right. forever. And they have the Coastal Commission and all this other kind of crap. So how, how can you have these left leaning states or, or, you know, deep, deep blue states that the claim that they care about, you know, like oh, we want to make sure people, whether it's homeless people or poor people have access to housing and things can be more affordable, that they haven't blown away these, these seventies, like it feels like it's almost like hippie era environmental regs that are basically not, they, they get abused. They're not even like, it's not like people are dumping toxic waste into the river now. Like that, 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 that's all right. like, it's, it's now a, we're going to use this legacy on the books thing to just grind any progress to a halt. So like, I, I just don't understand why, why hasn't that shifted then, right? It's like the state of California is the state that is completely dysfunctional and they can't build the high-speed rail. Whereas, whereas Florida is the one, you know, you'd expect that they wouldn't even care about rail, right? It's like everyone's going to hop in a car in Florida because, you know, America. Like, so I, 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 where is that disconnect? Uh, a couple of places. I would say two places. Number one is that the, the liberalism and leftism of the 70s was very honestly a localist pastoralist movement by a bunch of people who were used to thinking of, you know, they had been deeply influenced by the agrarian, the populist movement of the, of the, you know, plains farmers and all those people. And we have this history, you know, our, our massive land endowment allowed us to spread out, made local communities very important and gave us this institutional history such that even our liberalism and leftism was went in very hard for localism and this idea of community. Also being a very diverse country, you have people who want to become homogeneous communities or who already are who and who want to keep it that way uh, on the left as well as the right. Um, you know, like people like hippies in Vermont don't want, you know, a bunch of business bros moving in or whatever. And so this is our legacy of localism and of spreading out and everybody doing their own thing in their own little village. That sort of, uh, and I think that the second thing is that a lot of the people in blue states that you see supporting, uh, you know, you know, stopping stuff from getting built, are actually conservative in many ways, and in a in a, and they're they're liberal because they have to say or or leftist pretend leftist because they have to sort of say the right things about social issues. They've got to talk about like, they've got to do land acknowledgements and say like, we're on indigenous land and blah, blah, blah. But then when you look like these people have multi-million dollar properties that they have no intention of giving to any indigenous group. So, um, li limousine liberal, I think is the, the pejorative that you use. For it is. It's limousine liberal. And guess what happens when you, your society, your economy grows enough that a lot of people can have limousines. Well, you've got a lot of limousine liberals and America has a lot of limousine liberals and, um, you know, and, and they are exactly limousine liberals, except that that concept was made during a time when there were relatively few educated upper class people in America. Now there are a lot of educated upper class people in America, the PMC, the professional managerial class, um, which, uh, a lot of these people have conservative instincts, but couch it in liberal or leftist ideas. So that's where you see those signs on the yard that say, in this house, we believe that black lives matter. Love is love, blah, blah, blah. Check all the boxes. And then next to it is a sign saying no new, no new apartment buildings here. Build those somewhere else. Because ultimately these are well-to-do, mostly white people, right? Um, I, I don't want to racialize everything, but mostly white people, well-to-do, People living in, you know, single family home communities and blah, 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 whose wealth depends a lot on the appreciation of their single family homes. And they are naturally the type of people you'd expect to be conservative, except that, you know, they 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 pay homage to the liberal, you know, the the sort of, yeah, like like standard liberal views, or in some cases in Berkeley, they'd even act like leftists because that's what you do. That's local culture. You conform to the local culture. In, you know, a hundred years ago, they would have like gone to church, right? They would have conformed to local Christian culture. Now they conform to local liberal culture, but they're on a, on a substantive level, they're conservatives. They don't want poor people living in their neighborhoods or coming to their neighborhoods on a train and walking around and, you know, being poor all over the place or whatever, you know, they, they don't want, they want to keep, and, and, and 60 years ago, 40 years ago, you'd, you'd have people saying, well, I want to keep out the criminal element. And, and if you're in California, 
you can't say that because that's against the local values, but you can still do it. You just have to use different rhetoric for it. Yeah, you just blame the developers for building market rate housing. Exactly. Exactly. These are conservatives. You know, Dean Preston, the the most leftist, uh, you know, NIMBY um, San Francisco supervisor, his family is like a bunch of multimillionaire landowners. They are the landed gentry, uh, you know, whose wealth is based on on owning the land, um, the indigenous land. So how does that how does that change? Like what like what what level of shame do do or hypocrite? I, I guess maybe they don't care. Like people are completely Never. fine having the cognitive dissonance of of you know they yes. they say there is no limit left you know talk left act right yes or vote right right <laughs> like or yes know. right. So the, the question is when essentially when the people who are harmed by these policies just when it reaches a breaking point and they start demanding new housing whatever electoral grids that don't fail things like that, when people just start getting really mad and demanding those things. And that can be a painful process, especially when you've got, um, you know, the Republicans in California are no real force because they got eviscerated by their failure to court Hispanics when it really mattered. Now they're not even really playing catch up effectively. And you see the the difference in Texas, right? In Texas, uh, conservative, you know, the, the, the conservatives, the Republicans have always assiduously courted the Hispanic vote and they they don't usually win a majority of it, but they get pretty close. You know, you see like they'll they'll win 44 percent of the of the Hispanic vote, most of which isn't like this isn't a special situation like, you know, with with Miami and Cubans. This is this is just Mexican people living in Texas. Like, you know, um, the, these are these are just uh, people who. Some people whose families are like old, old, old Mexican families from Texas, but a lot of people are just kids of recent immigrants who who get, you know, assimilated to conservative ideas because the 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 right in Texas is not exclusionary in the way that the right in California was in the 80s and 90s and early and 2000s, really, where they said, you are aliens, you're, you know, stop them, put up a wall, blah, blah, blah. They didn't onboard the 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 Mexican immigrants and their kids into conservative culture. And so they, they were out of power for a generation. The reason Democrats are hegemonic in California is because the Republicans made the fatal mistake of trying to keep Hispanics out instead of bringing Hispanics in. Ronald Reagan tried to fix this. He tried to say, he said, he said, Latinos are Republicans. They just don't know it yet. He said that when he was governor of California, he was trying to argue to his own party that this is the future. You've got to embrace these people. He argued for more immigration from Mexico and they didn't, then they, the Texans heeded that, that idea and the California Republicans did not. And that's why in Texas, there, there's now, nobody's talking about Texas going purple anymore after all the heavily Mexican border counties switched to Republicans in the last election. And everybody's talking, you know, but nobody's talking about California becoming competitive again. So that's the lesson. The lesson is that the California Republicans seeded the field by going with this Steve Miller bullshit. You know, Steve Miller, the 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 Trump advisor guy, came out of SoCal in the 80s. And, and they, they went with this exclusionary Pete Wilson bullshit. Like, um, that they they failed for a generation. And that's that's on their head. You know, that's one reason that California is completely hegemonic. Democrats are completely hegemonic in California, and there's no pressure forcing Democrats to say, well, if we don't build housing, we could lose this election. If we could lose, we could be the party out of power. We could go back into opposition. There's no there's no competitive two party system. Um, And ultimately, that is the Republicans fault. You know, the Democrats sat there and took advantage of it and now are hegemonic, but they're not feeling that pressure. And so that's anyway, rant over. But that's basically what I see as having. So to summarize, a charismatic centrist uh, candidate on the Republican side who could court Latinos potentially could change the destiny of California. Maybe so. And, and Schwarzenegger was that, but, um, but the problem is that he didn't persuade his own party to change. Reagan yeah. sort of was that too, in a way, um, you know, Reagan pissed off hippies, but he governed as a centrist. Uh, and so, um, yeah, you need someone to do more than just win the, win the swing vote for, you know, a couple elections. Uh, you know, like Schwarzenegger did, you need someone to change the basic Republican Party. So at the local level, the California Republicans are going out and recruiting Latinos as fast and as hard as they can, uh, you know, and and using Spanish language media. Uh, if you have, you know, like 
not just Spanish language, English yeah. language media too, obviously, and just doing everything you can, like Republicans are doing in Florida and Texas, and increasingly in Arizona and Nevada as well, um, uh, and and starting to in Colorado. But then California, they've resisted because you have this, and it's concentrated in SoCal uh, and the Central Valley. But it's this this idea that uh, Mexican immigrants are invasion. That's an invasion of our country. That has got to end. And whoever this charismatic savior of the Republican Party in California is has to convince them to stop thinking of Mexican immigrants as invaders uh, and start thinking of them as votes. Dan, are you ready? Yeah, no, I think uh, I mean, I'm I'm it's insane to me the the size of the prize that is California and the ability for California, I think, to shape the future of the country, just given all the innovation that's here, that it's such a dysfunctionally run state, as you point out it's actually because of a lack of competition, right? It, it's, it's, this is what happens when you have a monopoly is that there's no pressure to actually improve. Right. There's no pressure without the threat of competition. So if you have, right. what's interesting is that Japan has this one party that wins like 95% of the elections, right? And then they don't always win, but they almost always win. And they, um, they keep changing and updating their policies with like Abenomics and some other changes in the, in the seventies and eighties. Um, even though there was an, almost never an opposition that could beat them because it's always somewhat competitive in Japan. There's all like opposition is always threatening to come in and beat them. And they, they hew very carefully to democratic principles and Japan has much less identity politics than America. And so it's votes can switch very quickly. Identity politics cements groups within a party for a long time. So America has this, you know, we, we've got, but but identity politics on both sides, you know, like obviously the the SoCal right wing people who thought that Mexican immigration was an invasion, that's identity politics, too. And so, you know, like so. So Japan had this advantage of not having as much identity politics. Um, but but we can overcome that in America. We just have to make, you know, ideas more important than identity. Well, I mean, I think, as you point out. Texas and, and Florida are both examples where if they deviate too far to one side and, you know, if you just read mainstream media, you would assume that Texas is this hellhole that's run by Republicans. But the reality is they have to govern in a more centrist oriented way than the Democrats have to do in California. That's right. The Republicans in Texas will make they will propose crazy bills that essentially never pass. Um, Texas has a culture of proposing crazy things and then and then deciding after long deliberation that it would be better not to do a crazy thing. And so I know Texas culture really well. Right now there's this proposal to ban uh, ban people uh, with citizenship of China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran from buying property in Texas. That will fail. Uh, Abbott supported it probably because he knows it'll fail. Um, it's a really boneheaded, crazy idea that someone suggested that never should have come out of whatever committee. Um, and But you see things like that in Texas, but then ultimately you see pragmatic policies get actually done, right? You rarely see Texas actually shoot itself in the foot. You just see it waving its gun in the direction of the foot and yelling a lot. Um, so, you know, Texas is a pragmatic state and they build a lot of housing and they they look at Texas is, the, is, is about to take the lead from California and green energy. Just by yeah. letting people build. I mean, I, I've i been in California almost 10 years now, and it's just insane to me. You know, take Elon Musk, right? How, how could you be trying to scare away Elon Musk? Regardless of his antics or, you know, if he does childish stuff here or there, he, he built the next Ford in California, was manufacturing stuff in California. Yeah. And then progressively, they, they pushed him to the limit where, you know, now start putting stuff in Nevada, start putting stuff in Texas. And I actually live in LA now because my wife got a job at SpaceX and, and to see basically more and more of SpaceX moving outside of California, yes. it, 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 probably if you just aggregate number of jobs from an entrepreneur like that also, by the way, have all of the economic spectrum, right? Like there are workers working for Tesla and SpaceX who don't have college education compared to that, to something like Google or whatever. So as an employer in the state of California that it benefits a variety of different people to, to be pushing him out of the state when one of his companies is single-handedly changing the the market for electric vehicles. It's it just, it's so yeah. asinine. Well, yes. 
Yes, that's true. But I have to represent for Texas now and say that I'm happy about this trend simply because of Texas. Like Texas needs the money and Southern Texas needs the money. Like, you know, you, uh, that, that's a poor area that Starbase Texas will, will bring a lot of money into that area, you know, and, and Texas need, I want to see the Texas tech cluster tech cluster grow. And so I, you know, I can't be too unhappy about this trend, but it is dumb of California to do this. You're right. No, I want to go back to what we were talking about earlier when we said that tech has become less progressive because the, you know, the tech CEOs or people that you are describing, it's not like they're more right on immigration or, or trade than they were. They're not, it's not like they're, you know, against gay marriage or pro, pro choice. Like, I don't even see the difference between them and kind of the abundance agenda people you, you were talking about. It, it, from my perspective, I see the only change that's really happened is that CEOs are more comfortable pushing back against activists within their companies, and they're more comfortable pushing back against kind of the media in, in general. Um, so what do you see, like how exactly is tech becoming more, more right wing if it's not on kind of the issue spaces that we're talking about? Well, I, I would not say it's becoming more right wing. I would say it's becoming less left wing. I would say that tech has always been a liberal leaning uh, industry, um, especially, I mean, compared to like, I don't know, energy, chemicals or any any sort of old line industry tech was where you know if you if you were a hippie but you also wanted to like work and build a business and and still have those hippie values like uh, Steve Jobs right he was this you know about Steve Jobs he was a hippie and so but a lot of these tech has always been very liberal and i would say that it will continue to be liberal but it but woke fervor is dying down and part of that I, I, it's just it's just less messianically uh progressive Not, maybe but not, there are conservatives in tech, and I would say they're probably more likely to be on the finance side of tech. You're more likely to find a conservative VC or a conservative, you know, like exec, there's not many of those, than you are to find a conservative, just like your regular, like, you know, L5 software engineer is probably going to be a liberal. Um, but I would say that the shift is is about economics. Uh, when, when who, I forget who here said that it was a zero interest rate phenomenon, but I think that that's basically right but that it goes a little beyond interest rates. Um, it goes to monopoly power. So do you guys know about Gary Becker's uh, discrimination theory? No. no. All right. So in um, in the 70s, uh, or he may have, may have originally come out in the 60s, but in the 70s, Gary Becker said, um, okay, so you know, he's a Chicago school economist, very like free marketer, libertarian dude. And he said, um, why do companies discriminate against women and minorities? Because they have monopoly power and they can afford to. Here's women who could do all this work, offering to work for cheap, who would be productive and work for cheap. Here's minorities offering to work for cheap and be productive. And then companies are choosing not to hire them because like, yes, they have they have racist and sexist people, but in a competitive environment, racism and sexism are a luxury that go right out the window. So in a competitive environment, you can't live if you're racist or sexist. You just lose and die because you're not taking advantage of that talent, right? You're not taking advantage of the resource that you have. And so his, his idea was basically increase comp industrial competition and you'll see racism and sexism decline in, you'll see discrimination, I should say, discrimination along race and gender lines decline in companies. We do have, and in the eighties, companies became much more competitive. Our industries became more competitive and we do have evidence that he was right to some degree. It didn't make all that stuff vanish, but it did have an effect. It did make it decline. But since around the year 2000, we've seen a reversal in competitiveness where you see much more concentration, you see higher profit margins, um, you see in certain sectors, big network effects, and tech is certainly the most important sector of network effects, right? Like, you know, how did, how did Twitter survive this long being such a shambolic, inept company? The reason is because it had a network effect, right? And, and zero interest rates. And zero interest rates, but it, uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. But like, so yeah, I'm saying zero interest rates probably contribute to this, but I don't know of any good research about the interaction between zero interest rates and monopoly power. I, I know that people have hypothesized both sides of that, so I'm not going to hold forth on that and give a strong opinion, but definitely people like Google five yeah. years ago felt we are an invincible search monopoly. And maybe part of that was because of ZERP and maybe not. But they certainly felt that no one, we just, we have a, a, a magic machine that prints money. We can use that money on whatever we want. So let's use it on a million people to like spend all day sitting here thinking about AI ethics. 
Uh, and so you can afford to spend it on that. Let's afford, let's, let's onboard some people who, who, you know, um, say a lot of nice political stuff, but don't really work. Maybe they did, maybe they onboarded some of those people. Um, I've, I've been reading about cultural problems at Google a lot, uh, which my Google friends didn't really talk about as much as they probably should have, but, um, they did a little bit, but, 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 but go back to Google they though. Afford to do this stuff. Yeah. It, it, up until last year, no one was like, Google was the unassailable company, right? right. Everyone was kind of crapping on Facebook, like the metaverse strategy. This is so stupid. Like be more like Google. Look, they're just, just printing money. And then out of nowhere, you have a, a kind of breakthrough technology with chat GPT. And now people within a very short period of time are starting to say Google search monopoly doesn't look so strong. Right. Right. And so, right. yeah, to, to be fair, I, I think like, I think every smart person was basically saying a year ago, Google, Google is just this magic money printing machine and that they can afford to be lazy and, and have all these, you know, political beliefs right. rather than actually focused on winning in the market. And can also afford to spend money on positive things that we like, like uh, basic research, like DeepMind. Right. Right. No, sure. Google Maps. So there, there's Bell, like like Bell, the, right? Bell Telephone. Yeah. The, the other thing is, is Trump propped up wokeness by uh, preventing people from pushing back against it, lest they be uh, right. sort of correlated or you know associated with Trump? You don't get kind of Brian Armstrong standing up, you know, in a in a Trump environment, probably. Right, and so of of course that's coming. That's about to come back with the return of Trump uh, next year. So we'll do. You, do you think he wins the nomination? I don't know, but I think that he'll occupy a lot of the airwaves. Well, I mean, that's good for the the media companies, right? Like. He sells. Yeah, New York Times won't be complaining, but well, they, they'll be complaining. Yeah. Um, so then, complain but subscribe. Yeah, but complain back. right. Mash that, mash that button. Uh, <laughs> no, instead you should subscribe to noopinion.substack.com. Please subscribe and give me money. Right. No, anyway. <laughs> Wait, but I, I don't know if we recorded this part because when you started, I have been reading Noah's newsletter prior to Substack and for for a really long time. And I disagree with him a lot of things, but I, I think he's incredibly reasonable and worth reading. So I, I highly, highly recommend it. Thanks so much, man. I yeah. appreciate it. A a amen to that. P perhaps we should we should wrap on, on that note. No, is there anything uh, else you wanted to uh, to to say to our, our tech audience? There was a I, I forgot there was a list of topics we were down. Oh yeah. So so my advice to to tech people. I have this this piece of it, cultural advice to people in tech. Uh, in especially in the Bay Area, please, which is um, it's easy to go through your whole life here just hanging out with the tech people and never talking to people who run a grocery store or make art or, um, you know, like work in a restaurant or or just, you know, I don't know, work as realtors or anything like people outside tech. We don't or just a massage therapist, I don't know, aromatherapy people. I don't know. There's a million people here. Like most of the most of the actual people here are not tech people. But they're here. They're people. And tech, I feel like there's become th that in the last uh, 10 years, I would say, 10 to 15 years, maybe just 10, there's developed this idea that if you hang out with non-tech people, you're just hurting your future. You need to be networking. You need to be... Um, you need to be like tech maxing all the time, you know, just like hang out with only, only the tech people are real and everyone else is sort of a shadow or a ghost. And if you, if you hang out with any non-tech people, you're just hurting your future. You're running with the wrong crowd. What kind of signal are you sending to that, you know, to, to your big tech prospective employer or to a VC or to people you might want to hire or whatever, like, it's just a bad look, man. You should just hang out with just the tech people and they're low IQ. They're not smart enough anyway. So why would I hang out with just some dumbass aromatherapist? Right. And so like, there's only a very few non-tech people who get sort of admitted to the, the tech world like me, you know, cause I write this blog and like, you know, I don't know, like I, I can do bath as well as tech people, whatever, but like, but you, um, you don't, you know, that that's, that's rare. I would say tech people need to get out of this shell and that will lead to a better San Francisco and a better Bay area. If tech people become, you know, become more of a part of the community instead of existing solely in a parallel community laid on top of the underlying community where they only interact with other tech people. What's interesting now is that I'm starting to see a second layer of tech 
where it's just the AI people don't want to hang out with people who do like web programming or, you know, like backend stuff or, you know, they, they only want to hang out with other AI people because they it's like this added layer of like elitist uh, insularity on top. That's got to stop. Like, <laughs> what are you even doing? Uh, I mean, no, it doesn't have to stop. Like, you, you can do this if you want. You can have your little click, never get outside it if you want. But one reason why the tech industry has not had a more positive effect on local politics is because the tech industry people don't know the local people at all. Yeah, I would look, I live in LA now, so I, I have a little bit more perspective on it. And mm. yeah. I, I think what's really challenging about the Bay Area, and it's also kind of, it's a, this, you know, the double-edged sword in the sense that it, what makes it magical is you can actually live in an existence where everyone around you is this super ambitious, smart tech person. And that rate of osmosis and idea collision is, it doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. If, if you want to work on kind of like building the future, I would imagine if you were in entertainment or finance in New York, like these kind of like industry towns. But I think that the, the clickiness, I, having been in San Francisco for 10 years at working in crypto, like that, I think always exists on the, the, whatever the trendy technology is. And at this point, SaaS, which I don't know if it was ever that cool, but you know, it, mobile, mobile maybe was the, the better example as like early 2010s. And I, I kind of missed that era, but, but I think there's always kind of some tip of the spear with the, the most influential VCs are interested in investing in it. Like, and, and, and basically the media loves covering it because it's, it's sensational in some way, right? Crypto, obviously, and then AI now with all the stuff that's blowing up about, you know, the chatbots going off rails. But I do think that the, the interesting thing about having been in the Bay Area for 10 years and now in LA, and when I was in the Bay Area, I was kind of like, if you're not in Rome, like, why, why are you even trying to work in tech, like do something different? I definitely think you can do it outside the Bay Area. The one caveat that I think is hard is if you don't have a pre-existing network, living outside the Bay Area or, or kind of being outside that bubble, you're, you're always going to kind of be in, uh, you just, you haven't tasted like the, the big, big leagues. And I think having been in the Bay Area for 10 years, building a network, really understanding how Silicon Valley works, I, I feel like I can build a company and, and do tech stuff in LA. And then actually not always be surrounded by other tech people. So you you can get the best of both worlds. And I do think COVID shifted that a little bit and that the aperture is now open. There are a lot more people who otherwise would have been lifers in Silicon Valley who are now kind of sprinkled around the rest of the country. And I do wonder if over the next 10 or 20 years that that does have an impact because there is something to be said for someone who was deeply and, and now with the kind of like cloud, you can still be connected into Silicon Valley. Because you, you, the, the things that Silicon Valley have that keep that ecosystem going is, you know, that angel investor who after one meeting is willing to write a 25000 or $100,000 check that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. And, and so exporting that culture a little bit more um, maybe is the way to actually solve for it. And, and I know you're specifically talking about the people in the Bay Area, but maybe, maybe the answer is there are going to just be fewer people in the Bay Area um, over time and, and that tech culture actually spreads out, but then is in places that are not as concentrated from an industry town, so to speak. I hope so. Yeah. Again. Um, yeah. Everybody moved to Texas. Texas is great. <laughs> are, are you in Texas? No, no, no. I'm, I'm in San Francisco. <laughs> I, if, if I move, it's going to be back to Japan. So I think that that move is probably in the offing, but I've got some health stuff I need to take care of here first. Cool. Well, really cool. enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, no, thanks so much. This has been great. Likewise. Yeah. It was great. Awesome. Cheers. SecureFrame is the leading all-in-one platform for security and privacy compliance. SecureFrame helps you get SOC 2 audit ready in weeks, not months, and it's used by thousands of companies like AngelList, Coda, and Remote. I believe in the company so much I invested in it, and I recommend it to all my portfolio companies. Sign up for a free demo at secureframe.com and mention Moment of Zen during your demo to get 20% off your first year of SecureFrame.